study is a guide on um, the state's treatment of um, treaties with indigenous nations. And the study clearly indicates that um, treaties um, should not be domesticated under the um, jurisdiction of the state. And so I, I think like in order to protect and uh, protect our treaties from domestication under Canadian law, that that treaty study and the guide um, that that treaty study provides us should be included in this, in, in this initiative. Miigwech. Thank you. Microphone number one again, please. Miles Richardson, I'm proxy for Skidigat, my home community in the Haida Nation. I wanna acknowledge the Algonquin people in whose territory we're gathered. I have a simple, um, friendly, I hope, um, amendment to, I guess under therefore be it resolved, to add that before Canada enacts any of this rights recognition legislation, that they formally announce a modern royal proclamation commitment to the proper nation-to-nation -nation relationship. The mover and seconder can word that prettier than that. But those recommendations are out of RCAP over 22 years ago and Truth and Reconciliation Commission both recommended that. And I'm really serious about that because in 1763, the British Crown committed, in, through the Royal Proclamation, to not alter our human rights without a formal treaty with the Crown. They changed their mind. They met, were met in Niagara Falls by our people with the two-row wampum and other things, which are still appropriate today, as we heard. For the past 150 years, we've gone the wrong road, that colonial road that the TRC has said is wrong. The good news is that this government has announced their commitment to a proper nation-to-nation -nation relationship, but that hasn't always seen the light of day. You know, when it gets to the bureaucrats, when it gets into any legislative amendments, it gets muddied up and doesn't happen. We need this formal modern commitment on behalf of the nation-state of Canada that this is their intention in, in their relations with indigenous people so that people in the provinces, in the municipalities, in their families, at their kitchen tables know that this nation-to-nation -nation relationship is what this country is committed to and it's all of our job to make it work. And before they do any of this legislation, it's time to do that now. I believe that's what we should be telling the Prime Minister should be committing to that tomorrow morning, if they're serious about this. And if they're not, who cares what goes in that legislation? You know, UNDRIP is a framework for reconciliation, we keep hearing. The standard of that relationship is consent. Consent is the standard for relations between equals. Consultation is for an inferior. We got to get it back to that. And they need to get on with those recommendations which have been before them for too long, before any of this legislation. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Thank you. A uh, very good conversation. I just asked to the mover and the seconder the following, uh, to assure the relationship is Crown and First Nation, and my perspective, cows is First Nation. Add to the whereas, they call on the Governor General to acknowledge their role as the sole representative of the Crown. In addition to therefore, call upon the Governor General to participate in First Nations led agendas when requested by the First Nations. Thank you very much. Okay, and I think you just will ask you to, where would you like to direct uh, Chief Camus over to the resolutions just to make sure that we get the right wording from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One more microphone, one, then we're over to you, Cook B. Judy. 
Good afternoon. I'm Mary TG. I come from Taco Lake First Nation. I am the proxy for my chief. I am also Maushkabu, which is my hereditary chief's name, which is White Wolf. I'm Gixan and Carrier. I'm Lakjabu clan, and I am a rights holder. I would like to um, talk about the um, amendment to the number one, the first, therefore be it resolved. Um, so at the end it says, or otherwise without the free prior and informed consent of First Nations rights holders, a friendly amendment to state that as the nation defines their rights holders, especially in British Columbia where we are, my governance is the potlatch system, I already have my own governance structure, I am a rights holder, as is each and every one here. Innately we have the right to be indigenous, innately we have the right to be self-governing. And at the very, very base of the definition of self-government or self-determination is the ability to make decisions. And that's what we need right now, that Canada is willing to come forward and in their own documents say to that they would implement a recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights will ensure the Government of Canada respects constitutionally protected Indigenous rights and provides policies and mechanisms for Indigenous people to exercise their rights. I was born in 1967, which is only seven years after we got the vote. Um, for those that can't do math, that makes me 39. But I think um, <laughs> we have to remember why we're here. Why we're here, what our, all our goals are, is for one, to better the lives of our people, but also to protect the resources and to protect the lands for the enjoyment of, for those not yet born. And how do we do that? if we're not even recognized, if our rights are not affirmed. And I do believe that, Michelle, your wording is absolutely correct, that we have to talk about affirmation. I am tired of going begging hat in hand for pennies from any level of government to take care of our most important res resource, our children. For heaven's sakes, we've got to be done with that. We are here to better those lives, and if this is what we need to do, we have to work hard, and mover and seconder, and all of us in this room to ensure that we get this resolution passed so that we're not here 150 years down the road saying we need something changed. Masai Miigwech. Thank you. Microphone number two, and then we're back over to microphone number one. Chief Judy Wilson from the Skaneth, from the Sikawapan Nation. I'm part of the Union BC Indian Chiefs Executive as well, and the First Nations Leadership Council. I'm here on behalf of our Skaneth community. Uh, one of the, and, and I want to acknowledge the whole nines of the Okwankan as well in the prayer. I, one of the amendments I've seen that's not in here, and I actually uh, questioned Minister Bennett when she was over at, at our Rights Recognition Forum in Vancouver, was why she can't say the word title. And she said she didn't want to say the word title because it's very complex. And I said, well, why can't you explain that? It is complex because our nations are all different. Our nations are all diverse right across Canada. And as uh, Mary T.G. explained, we have different governing uh, structures in each of our nations. Uh, what I wanted to add under the first A, whereas, is Article 26. And Article 26 actually talks about uh, Indigenous uh, right to lands, territories, and resources. Uh, I'm not going to quote the full thing here, but it's in there. And the reason I'm saying it needs to be included is you cannot talk about rights without talking about title, because rights flow from title. It's from that uh, creator gave us that title, it gave us the set of what the rights and responsibilities that we have. So I th that has to be added. Um, and then the other part is that it's also important to add uh, under, I guess after B would be the call to action number 45. And the call to, be, uh, to action uh, 45 is, you know, the Royal Proclamation. I think Miles Richards talked a bit about that, but it already is in the Truth and Reconciliation and our, our uh, call to action 45. So if we inserted that, we would cover what he was saying in, in his, his statement there. And one of the other things that in reviewing this uh, resolution was the missing point of co-development. Uh, there's nothing in that resolution saying we are co-developing, co-designing, and we're involved. We're not just being consulted and we're just not also uh, being consented. We have to be involved. And I also recall what Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said. He said in federal legislation development, there's eight steps. We learned that in the legislation uh, language. One, and only three steps are we involved in anything. The rest is all up to cabinet, the rest is all up to government and legislation in that legislation process. So in reality, we're only involved in three steps of any legislation developed. 
So how are we going to de uh, deal with that? The rest is all privy to, to the cabinet, to the government. So we have to include that, and not that I'm agreeing with the federal structure that it's only limited to those uh, three steps. And I do agree with the affirmation or the definitive statement that Canada's decolonizing and affirming our people and the re uh, relationship with our Indigenous people include inherent title and rights and treaty rights. And the other thing, the other point, the resolution that didn't get admitted uh, today was the 10 principles were developed unilaterally and they were, are not our perspective or our vision. They are the government's guides, they are not ours and they were not developed with us. But in the process for the AFN, I wanted to say a working group needs to be struck. And if it's just a start that we're doing this uh, uh, resolution, that, you know, that's a start. But it has to be a transparency and ac accountability back to the nations. And we need, we need to start drafting that nation-led process. And there, there should be another uh, Chief's Assembly just on this. And it needs to be focused on what, because this is one of the most profound legislations that we're going to be dealing with in probably this decade, probably in this era of reconciliation uh, after 150 years. So I wanted to say that, and those are just my observations quickly, because everything came very quickly. And I don't think it's fair to all the chiefs, all the delegates that traveled all parts of Canada to be here to talk about this re legislation on the rights and implementation of our rights, that we had to have a better process on how this was dealt with, not just in limited preliminaries, not just in limited speakers that can come up to talk about it, but we needed to have our nations talking about it and make real recommendations on how this process was going to work. So I'm not really happy on how the AFN rolled this out. And I know they're not the right holders, but we have to have better mechanisms so we have proper uh, consent of our nations that the process is a better one. Cook Sham. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Thank you very much. My name is Okimawa Squail, Margaret Bear. I'm from Ochapaways Nation of Treaty 4 territory. I would first of all just like to acknowledge our, uh, our creator, you know, for this beautiful day, the, the opportunity that we're able to come together and gather and talk about, you know, the important matters that affect our homelands. So thank you kindly, you know, to our sisters and brothers of the territory here for hosting the meeting for us today. Um, I have here with me um, Wes George. Wes works along my side as a political advisor along with uh, uh, an expert on United Nations work and he does a lot of uh, technical work uh, for me and uh, one of the things I just want to say that is uh, uh, Chief, um, my sister Chief Lynn Ecos from Sakame Nation uh, Treaty 4, she spoke before me and uh, uh, it's important, you know, and I support the, the, the uh, international standards being incorporated into the resolution. So uh, with that, uh, we do have, you know, another uh, comment to make and at this time, uh, us two, we had to work real fast and incorporate, you know, uh, another resolution into this one. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Wes George to present our position. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wes George. I'm from the Ochapwees Nation. I work exclusively on Indigenous peoples' rights and uh, uh, at the UN Nations, I've been spending the past 29 years working at that level. Um, I agree with a lot of the wording within the resolution and uh, support what uh, Chief Akus had indicated in terms of international rights and standards to be included into the resolution. Um, in regards to the UN study on treaties, that's one of the basic documents that's absent from any discussions anywhere. And uh, it's a prime document, a primary document that uh, international, the, the Treaty 4 chiefs have indicated within their position as uh, a founding document to which the, the basis for this rights framework is to evolve. So we, we flagged that. For the sake of this uh, uh, resolution, we have two friendly additions to, to make, uh, item number six and number seven. And number six, we'd like to also indicate that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples applies to everyone, not just for us, or not just for Canada to, to honor for us. It applies to them in a very holistic way. 
we need to need, keep that in mind. So with that in mind, number six would say, invoke our legitimate rights to self-determine the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a legally binding and non-aspirational legal standard and therefore is considered to be an international treaty equal to other United Nations treaties. And we'd like that point uh, as item number six. Item number seven is, is also very important because like I said, it's the UN Declaration applies to all of us, but yet when I come here, I have to pay $350 to um, get into a place where I can't speak only through my chief. So it's violating my right to participate in decision making and my free prior informed consent, the rules of this organization. So if the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is, is to be made um, operational, we have to make it operational as well on us. We can't always ask Canada to do this for us and us not do it to ourselves. We have, it's, a, it's a, a, an agreement or a, a process that goes always. So I'd like to add number seven. To fully implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to achieve the principles of reconciliation, the Assembly of First Nations Organization, Convention, Administration, and Executive, including all policies and relationships with Indigenous nations, all levels of governments, and international entities must be reformed completely to be in compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So with that, thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Mishnaka's uh, chief team series from Batchwana. I want to um, acknowledge the uh, land and the people in the area, the Algonquins, and thank them for hosting this and say good afternoon to the elders here this afternoon and national chief, regional chief. We're just going to ask you to get a little bit closer to the microphone. Uh, you're, you're, yeah. you're sounding shy. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not shy. <laughs> thank you. I. Um, We've been uh, looking at this resolution extensively over the course of the day, and um, in Ontario, we've got a, a litany of issues that we wanted to see incorporated into the, the text, and, and Jared's been working with us from the AFN. I'm wondering if we can have uh, a session outside of this forum in the next short while to go through all of these amendments, modifications, additions, and come back to you with a more uh, collective uh, resolution. And the sooner the better. I'm, uh, we've got a lot of uh, input that I'm hearing from a lot of people that still want to see incorporated. So I'd, I'd hope that you'd be able to move us along, Madam Chair Chimigwich. Thank you very much, and indeed that was something I did uh, bring up earlier, and the request was to hear the comments right now, and indeed 18 uh, various proposed amendments so far. Uh, microphone number one, please. Hey, Bissani, uh, good afternoon. I'm going to get to the Miskatna, I'm going to get to the I, I bring greetings to you today from our traditional territory of Pemichikamak. My name is uh, Chief Kathy Merrick. I was uh, initially noted to be one of the seconders for the, pre for the previous uh, documents. There was a mix-up to that. I was here to be able to, uh, to promote a resolution which was Manitoba per perspective from our perspective as Manitoba chiefs. So in saying that, I, I have with me my counselor, uh, David, counselor David Leroy Miswagen, who's gonna speak to some of the issues that uh, have been raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. 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 Mr.
nicht da gut ein Tote, wo man am Sagwas kriegen nicht der Gaste. Stei, ne Mäemet on ente nu teepian. Ne Mäemet on ene metago keise wa gutu a keisi niu ja kaski niu. Minu muuta ka ne muuta maag, muun ja oepi nigeuin, muun ja oepi kiskeuin ja apata aguta. Agua, mis ta igi eepanu, ne Mäemet on entsegan, keet jaatsa, keet teega agi peise piigis kote kua aguk. O moce askio nasuevin, ka itse kaateg. Ta on sigi itse kuh taavinu, ka agi se vaagu taigu agaskinu. Miina, ka agi negon kaap maat siima ka agu taaski. Ego ne, ka amit se menta maana nuts ka agi se kaagniina. Keet teieg, ka agi peise miini kuaguk ne poogaavin, en nii siin. Hat sagt, ob Mutter und hat sagt, ob es genug Tage und nun tut der Mann und tut er nicht bei einem so Skalpeuern, wo ich da bin und da bin ich nicht bei Geschwäuern immer noch aus. Nun tut der Mann, der tut sich meinen Tag nicht sein. Nun tut der Mann, man hat gepäh nicht mehr, 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 Egi eges kes jään nii mu suun panna on tee paasteenam ka kiitvid. Ka kiitaa pagumad, kiitsjuge maasko. Is pieta koogud seguta ministigu. Egi peegu etse megu aega, mis tegusu. Ma tege kiivitsi aamegu aega igenaag. Munagi utsi miinau, mis tegusu. Ta tiiga aamaasud ka aega nägegu on ta te peegu mu nupanet. Munu viina ka aega utsi miinigud kuhta viina aega siei siin. Ta teo näsua tagagi nege konuta ministigu, egi musti piti koogi igenag. Ei see vaaga uutuag, ei siis ka nesiag, pugo, ketagi ueskaag. Uhtaavi nogigi minikuna vones võinu tõutsaapad siitaag, spoga nogigi minikuna on miigivaapa, et tõutsagagi see muagujaag, tõutsi aspad seag, uva näsue võin. Keht teie käepets muute ja võguuta, Ka kise mui ka mingu en uutsi taatsa, keta kiima missiag. Mootsuta ja mista maa keu, es naagu on, ta kipe vana suataag, ta kipe piigis kõesta maa kuag, aski vana sue võin, mina en nii võin. Ma on tugagi minni kuag, ais naagu seaga nuts. Moots ka kipite kõja taapaanu, ma on tu minni kui siina. Puguta kes kes seaga vaasi sak, ka mina ka egas ka ka nii taigitsik. Kui see tõuni nainu on, on see, ega nii nii stagu taavine ka kimiinud, et ta aapad siita on. Ma õngate, et tästa muaten ka ise piigis kohta kogu nüüd nii saanud, ka nüüd. Aapu, et tegu ei keta minu asun pitta maa, et ta kiiu jääk, et tegav tuuti jääk. Kõn tegu ei näata iges kenta maag, ta on sigitsi, ka kiitas ta maa kui isi jääk, miigu aapa. Mina kas kei siin tõudse näga tenda maag maad sinu taaski. Ega kohke peenagata maad noo nii saanak. I just want to acknowledge the Creator for allowing me to be here today to speak to my fellow relations, the nation of tribes from all across Turtle Island. I thank the chief of our nation for allowing me to speak as a young man who's been a helper with many elders in different ceremonial lodges where I've come to research our own oral history because my spirit was longing for that oral history to try and understand of who I am, where I come from, and where we need to go and to have informed choices that we need to make. There's two roads here I want to talk about, the relational road that our ancestors left for us. And the transactional road is what's being discussed here, including this very in important document that's very legal in nature. Lawyers cannot replace our elders' spiritual wisdom. God's unwritten law is out on the land. The unwritten law of the Creator is out all over Turtle Island. I just want to refresh our people all across here 
Language matters, my, rel my relatives. We are not a First Nation, based on our research finding. By using that political term, we're implying that we were the first nation to come on to North America, which was unoccupied, which is not true. Scientific evidence goes back, some of them two, three, four, five thousand years old, that we've always been here. We didn't come from the Bering Strait, contrary to Western education. Our ancestors were born and raised here. This is our land. This is our Indian land. This is our home. That's the research we need to go back to before we can even go to the United Nations. I don't come here to scold and disrespect anybody, but my spirit has to share with all of you, because we love each other as one people. But we're going to have to speak from the spirit, not from a piece of paper. And I'm sorry, you talk a lot about respect in this assembly, we're going to have to start respecting the Creator's unwritten constitution. But you cannot put a time frame on that respect when you talk about something sacred based on the foundation that was given to us by the Creator. We cannot rush into the rapids because once you shoot the rapids, there's no turning back for our people. I know we're hungry for the money. That's the carrot that's being dangled on a stick for our people that we have to be very careful. We got to have faith in those pipes and those lodges we work with so the spirits can guide us and help our nations right across this island. No amount of money is going to have any spirit. The elders said the most sacred treaty is our relationship to Mother Earth. Once you disconnect that, we're dead. <laughs> We have to go home. Politics has no place in the spiritual red road. I don't say that out of disrespect for the great leaders that are here who want the best for their people. <clears throat> what the elders said was the foundation that was given to us was our way of life from the Creator. The treaty promises made by the Queen in right of the British Crown were over and above our way of life. These funding arrangements that are being discussed here are legalistic in nature of a give and take process. We did not disagree with the terms our ancestors agreed to, except we need to implement the original understanding of that relationship. There's nothing to renegotiate here because we haven't even started implementing the 1875 in our case where the past sentiment entered into that treaty with the British Crown. We need to talk about those. We need to talk about that oral history. I'm sorry, quit waving at me. I don't mean to be rude because this is very important I, I for people. But I, I wanted to bring that message here because this resolution should be trashed and we need to go home and have a better approach to, that's going to be relational in nature that we can deal with the Governor General of Canada, who's the figurehead of the Queen, to implement the spirit and intent of the treaties. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, as you said, we, I, I, 19, 20, I, I don't know. But I was checking with the mover and seconder um, as well. Uh, it seems there was a call for it. I had proposed it. There was a call for it. They have agreed. We're going to, and we checked with the resolution committee, so right after we adjourn here, we're going to have a working group here on this resolution. We're going to just meet up in the front here right after this. So with that, I'm going to just pass over the podium to my colleague. Turn the attention of the delegation to Resolution 07, Drinking Water. Chief Lance Heyman, are you present? And Chief Dan George, are you present in the assembly? I see uh, Chief George here. Do I see Chief Heyman? Okay. Seconder, is that microphone too? I see a new, is, uh, we have a new mover. I'll go to microphone two, please. 
Chief Heyman isn't here, so I'm going to move it. Okay. Microphone one. Uh, Chief Linda Dabosky, Chiging First Nation. I'll second that. Thank you, Chief Dabosky. All right, you have the resolution in your kit. It was uh, on time and distributed. Essentially, the where therefore be it resolves, speak to the issue of the deficiencies in the Safe Drinking Water Act, Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act. Reference the fact that you passed two resolutions calling for reform of that act in 2017, and the government has responded positively. And so the therefore be it resolves are direct that the Assembly of First Nations to immediately co communicate to the federal government that in, in keeping with the government's commitment to reconciliation with First Nations, a joint legislative process will be initiated in full partnership with First Nations, including the development of a joint working group on safe drinking water for First Nations. And I see note some changes here that weren't here. So a joint legislative pro code development process and mandate will proceed in full partnership with First Nations, including the development of a joint working group on safe drinking water for First Nations. Two, direct the AFN to immediately appoint a Chiefs Committee on First Nations Safe Drinking Water legislation that will advise and support the development of a terms of reference for the creation of the joint working group on safe drinking water for First Nations. Three, direct the AFN to produce a draft framework for safe drinking water legislation for First Nations aligned with the phased approach recommended in the concept paper for consideration at the AFN Annual General Assembly in July 2018, and for direct the AFN and the Chiefs Committee on First Nations Safe Drinking Water legislation to develop a draft framework for the creation of the First Nations Water Commission. And five, direct the AFN to immediately develop and convey a funding proposal to the federal government that will ensure that the Chiefs Committee on First Nations Safe Drinking Water legislation and the Joint Working Group on Safe Drinking Water for First Nations have the resources required to participate in this joint legislative co-development process in full partnership with First Nations and the federal government. And additional six, direct the AFN to ensure the draft framework for safe drinking water legislation for First Nations affirms First Nations inherent water laws, standards, guidelines, and processes. With that, I look to the mover and seconder. Is there a need for a comment? <laughs> Do you wish to comment? Yes. Microphone two. I'd just uh, like to comment on some of the track changes that we did on the co-development process and get, getting the federal government to give us a mandate so that we continue this work and we're not going in, down a dead end path. So we, ha we want a mandate so that we can proceed with this work. Thank you. Um, also a number 5.6, direct the AFN to ensure the draft framework of safe drinking water legislation for First Nation affirms the First Nation inherent laws water laws, standards, guidelines, and processes. In BC, we, we have a few First Nations that develop their own water laws, and it's uh, the inherent right for First Nations to develop their own laws and framework, and we're, we're development in BC, so we put it so that all First Nations across Canada can develop their own water laws and implement them properly. And also, I'd like to, uh, uh, our, uh, Portfolio holder Kevin Hart has done a lot of work on this and I'd like to acknowledge him. Thank you. Uh, Chief, if I could just get one clarification in those uh, affirmations, you did ask for an amendment to number six, is that correct? Did you ask for an amendment or were you just clarifying? No, I was just clarifying. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there a need for seeing no need for a second uh, comment from the seconder? Chief McEnany, did you wish to make a comment before yeah. we look to the question? Yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, Irvinson can't vote on this because right now our negotiations on a case in Alberta. So right now we, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll vote no for now because right now we're in, we're in negotiations with the Crown. So yeah. just for the record. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate that clarification. Is there a need for further discussion? If not, we will move to the question. Thank you, Chief Brissett. Um, yeah, we'll note, we'll note the um, uh, situation that the Chief of Erminsking has in play, explained for us. Uh, given that, is there, 
Any opposition to this resolution? Noting Chief Ermanskin's comment, I see one, two, three, four in total. Thank you very much. Any abstentions from this resolution? Thank you very much. May I then conclude that the remainder of you support this resolution? Agreed? 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 Resolution 7 is properly adopted. Thank you very much. We'll ask uh, our Deputy Speaker Catchaway to bring up our last information item, which is the uh, Desjardins decision. Thank you. Thank you. Watch. Miigwech. So, digital decision, we have a presentation by Stuart Ruckney, AFN Legal Counsel, ha hailing from the Garden Hill First Nation in Manitoba. Local void as well. Local void as well. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I want to give you a quick update on the Dacian Oak case and the uh, amendments to the Indian Act regarding uh, Indian registration. So we had a dialogue session earlier today and basically I'll provide some information from that session and the general uh, tone and uh, direction that uh, the participants are recommending. So as we all know, the Indian Act has discriminated against First Nations people with respect to their membership or their citizenship since uh, 19, I mean, 1869 until 1995. And historically, the Indian Act tied status, Indian status to the male line. So all First Nations men, of course, had Indian status. A woman's status was tied to either her father or her husband. And uh, that existed up until 1985. As a result of that, there were a number of people that were excluded or removed from uh, membership or their citizenship with their First Nations. Now, there have been a number of attempts to correct this discrimination through Bill C-31, Bill C-3 in response to the MacIver case, and lastly, Bill S-3, the, um, the Dacian O case. Now, the recent amendments in Bill S-3 are a result of the two cases, the Dacian Oak case and the Gale case. Uh, with respect to the Dacian Oak, uh, what was argued in that case was that uh, depending on where one's ancestor was, whether they were a, a, a woman or a male, the impacts would have on later generations, particularly the grandchildren, would be tr they would be treated quite differently. In some cases, they'll have uh, status under 6.2 of the Indian Act, whereas the uh, same comparator group would have no status at all. Uh, in the Gale case, there was a challenge to the Indian Act provisions relating to the unstated paternity, where uh, the father was not declared on a birth certificate. In Canada, essentially deemed those people to be, uh, the parents to be non-status and the person was either denied status under the Indian Act. The court of, in that case, uh, the Ontario Superior Court found that that was a discriminatory practice as well. So Bill, this brings us to Bill S3, the legislation that was recently passed and uh, given royal uh, assent in December of 2017. And essentially, the federal government's approach to these two cases was a um, two-phase approach. The first phase would be introducing legislation to change of the Indian Act to make it comply with the court's decision. And the second phase was a broader uh, discussion on further Indian Act reforms related to Indian status. Now, the Bill S-3 dealt with four particular classes of individuals. The first ones being uh, the cousins issue, secondly, the siblings issue, thirdly, the issues of removed minors, and lastly, unstated paternity. And uh, rather than get into the specifics of these, essentially what happens in these cases, you may have relatives, sometimes uh, even siblings, uh, where their children are treated quite differently depending on whether you're a male or a female. So the 
Indian Act amendments that took place in Bill C-31, Bill C-3, and S-3, I mean, Bill C-3 and Bill C-31 really didn't address all the gender discrimination. So Bill C, Bill S-3 was passed and received royal assent in December of last year. And the federal government estimates that between 28 to 38,000 individuals will be eligible for Indian status uh, registration. Uh, they did provide information that as of April 30th, 2018, a total of 351 individuals have taken up uh, the opportunity to apply for Indian status. And uh, they expect more to be coming. Also, the uh, department has highlighted that uh, they have made some investments with respect to uh, this change to the Indian Act. They have invested $149 million in funding to implement Bill S3. $131 million of that will be going to the non-insured health benefits program. And the uh, $19 million essentially for uh, First Nation education. I should say 19 million for the uh, increased application, so that would be going to the department. Secondly, in budget 2017, 90 million dollars was provided for uh, additional supports for post-secondary education. So that's essentially what Bill S3 has done. Uh, under the legislation, Canada is obligated to provide, uh, to consult more broadly with First Nations on further Indian Act reforms. Now what the court said in the Deschino case, they said, We've been at this, we've been discussing this gender discrimination a number of times. Canada keeps basically bringing some people in and discriminating against similar type groups. And they suggested that Canada once and for all look at all discrimination in Indian Act related to uh, status, uh, the status provisions and provide uh, more comprehensive solutions to that. So under the Act, the minister now must initiate consultations with First Nations uh, communities, uh, First Nation governments, First Nation individuals. And uh, the Act highlights a number of areas where this can take place. The first one being adoption, the second one being the 1951 cutoff rule, uh, the second generation cutoff rule, uh, enfranchisement, and lastly, whether or not the federal government should be, even be involved in the, uh, determining who is a status Indian or not. Uh, the comprehensive consultations that are to occur will hopefully take place in the near future. Uh, the uh, Department of uh, the Crown Indigenous Relations has advised that hopefully they will start in the next few months. Canada is under, the, I should say, the Minister is under an obligation to report back to Parliament on those consultations. Now, we're tying this back to our discussion earlier today, and we've heard this throughout uh, a number of our discussions over the years with respect to Canada's role in determining who is a status Indian. And many would agree that Canada has no place in determining who our citizens are. Uh, it is generally accepted that First Nations themselves should determine who their citizens are and, and who should be provided uh, services in their communities. They also highlighted this afternoon that First Nations people, it is the First Nations themselves who know who their citizens are who know who the people that are tied to the land, tied to the culture, tied to their local community, and also their nation. And they're the best placed uh, representatives to determine who their citizens are, rather than Canada. It was also noted that when the treaties were first negotiated, the number of treaties and uh, the historical uh, treaties, when those were negotiated, Canada approached this, the, the First Nations and asked them, who are your citizens? And that information was provided. And it's really that aspect where the Crown seeks the advice and seeks um, information on who the citizens are that needs to be re-implemented, to be restored. That Canada itself should not be determining that, but be the First Nations, and Canada should be asking who the citizens are was also discussed earlier today that most countries around the world have a one parent rule with regards to citizenship. So if you're a Canadian or if you're an American or if you're a German and you have uh, children or offspring with someone from a different country, citizenship does flow to those individuals. So there's this nonsense uh, with respect to two parent rules and whether you're tied to 6-1 Indian or if you're 6-2 Indian, it really is nonsensical. And it 
applies a different standard on First Nations that doesn't apply to any other uh, nation across the, across the world. So that uh, paradigm and that type of thinking has to shift as well. Finally, uh, they talked about funding, that the federal government ties funding uh, to First Nation programs in relation to who's, how many status Indians are tied to their First Nation. Uh, that requirement or that uh, process of determining status, determining how much funding a First Nation get is also discriminatory and has to end. We recognize that there are a number of individuals uh, who live in First Nation communities. Some of them have married into the communities. Uh, really, the total population, some other formula that must be developed in consultation with the First Nations, rather than tying programs for specifically for First Nations, uh, for status Indians. And lastly, Council for the Deschanel case really wanted to highlight the fact that Deschanel was not arguing that the First Nation was discriminating against their community. I mean, the, the, that the, know, the, the First Nation was not discriminating against Deschanel. What the Deschanel was about was can, the, the litigants in that matter, Deschanel and his family, were really using Canadian courts to challenge a discriminatory federal law. And that was a process that they engaged. They were not arguing against their own community. Uh, they were fighting uh, an un basically an unjust law that was enacted by the federal government in their own legal systems. Now that that fight has been dealt with, Deschanel and their legal counsel reiterated this morning that it's really up to the First Nations themselves to determine who their citizens are and basically get Canada out of the picture. Lastly, we have to acknowledge and be mindful that the changes we're making now and the changes we're uh, uh, advocating for has to be mindful of the future generations yet to come. Our collective challenge in replacing this discriminatory Indian Act and the colonialistic processes that they enacted Really, the challenge for us is to create, and it's really a duty on us, our generations, to create a space for future generations to live in peace and harmony, where their identity and their attachment to the culture of their lands remains intact. And that was basically the, an update on uh, our discussions this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, that concludes the day's agenda. Uh, prior to adjourning, I'm gonna read in what we're gonna be doing tomorrow. Um, pipe ceremony, 6.30 in the morning. Um, registration will be open, 7.30. Uh, regional caucus sessions from 7.30 morning till 8.30. Um, the Circle of Trade shows open 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, we will be in the room here for 8.30. We will start at the mic at, at 8.30. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada will be here at 8.45 giving remarks. Uh, Minister Philpott will be giving remarks. Bill Blair will be giving remarks. And, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions at that point. We'll have a break. Um, again at 1 o'clock tomorrow after lunch. We are going to go into concurrent dialogue sessions again. Sorry, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, we're going into dialogue sessions. Dialogue sessions will be on Bill C-68, Bill C-69, cannabis legislation, federal accessibility legislation, options paper on child welfare, and Bill C-58. And then after the break, at, uh, then we'll go in for lunch. And then we're coming back into the room here for the, the follow-up um, to the main, the main plenary and any sub, sub resolutions that may have come from the, uh, from the dialogue sessions. And we should be wrapping up at 4.30 sharp tomorrow. So that's, uh, that's tomorrow's plan. So we're adjourned for the day. We'll see everybody tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Miigwech.